Um, I better introduce you to my team. So here's my team today, ladies. Come join me. So this is what I do. This is Nema, my middle daughter. She's going to have her hip examined today. Thank you. Dude. This is Tara, my youngest daughter. She's going to be a demonstrator. I'm going to show some surface anatomy on her. And this is my eldest daughter. This is Amina. She's my eldest daughter. She's going to be our knee for the day. So what I'm going to try and do is make sure I don't get in the way of anybody. But if I do, again, I'm going to try and leave you all unmuted. So if I get in the way and I stay in the way, just shout out, okay? And, um, and we'll see how we get on. All right? Good. So let's see if we can get things moving a little bit. Uh, if I can get myself up on screen. There we go. Right. Okay. So first of all, the first thing you need is the correct setting. This is my living room. This isn't normally the setting I have, but you do need uh, a good setting. So I don't have an examination couch. But what I do have is this large beanbag bed. That's going to make do for the day. Um, the next thing you need are some important orthopedic equipment. So I've got my tape measure. Here it is. I've got some gaffer tape. This is very important. <laughs> I've got a um, child's camp marker pen that I'll be using later on. And bizarrely, I've got some castanets there for Tara. So, good. Now, why don't we start with looking at the hip first, okay? So, so, remember, so remember, for all, for all orthopedic examinations, whether we're teaching at undergraduate level or postgraduate level, the mantra is always the same. If you can mirror read that, it says, look, feel, move, special test, okay? Because it's always the same. So it doesn't matter whether you're just about to take your consultant exams or you're sitting OSCEs, Moslers, it doesn't matter. It's always the same, okay? So we always look, which means that we don't touch the patient. Then we feel, which is when you do start touching the patient. We move, and depending on when you're doing this, because the examination scheme is changing next year, um, there are different parts to move or different bits of movement that you need to demonstrate. Um, and then the special tests come towards the end. Okay. So there are a couple of common ones between hip and knee. So we'll try and cover them as we go along. All right. So first thing about the hip is to, well, I would normally get the patient to start walking, but actually we're going to do that at the end because that's a traditional thing that we do at uh, undergraduate level. So what I'm going to do is, have you got your... Yes, then There are certain parts of the exams when you do them in the OSCEs which are always done really badly. And what I'm going to do is try and highlight those by getting my daughter Tara to uh, rattle the castanets when they come along. Just like that. Uh, good. So, right. See? Come on in. Right. So, first of all, we're going to look, okay? So, if I fold up. Name is top. There's not a huge amount to look at in the hip. You can look at the skin, and the one thing I would suggest we do look for are scars. So the one scar that I would expect anybody to see around the hip is a hip replacement scar. And if there's a hip replacement scar, later on in the examination when you do the movements, you're going to be really careful that you don't over move that hip because a dislocated hip in an OSCE is very hard to come back from. If you imagine that's your first case of the day and you dislocate somebody's hip, you're going to struggle to do cases four, five, and six. So don't dislocate a hip. So there's a tip at the top, okay? So here's where the gaffer tape comes in. Here's my gaffer tape. Hip replacement scars go right on the outside of the thigh about there. There we go. There's a hip replacement scar. You can't see it, but the greater trochanter is just here, okay? We're going to talk about that in a second. But to see that scar should give you a warning for later on in the examination, okay? As well as looking, you can see sinuses around here. You might see that the thigh is swollen. The other thing you're going to see, and probably the most important thing you're going to see, is wasting. So the two groups of muscle that are going to waste, particularly if you have hip arthritis, the two bits that are really important to see if you've got wasting for hip arthritis, because that's a very common case, are going to be the quads here. So there are your quads. Sorry, Amy. Good night. And the glutes at the back. They're the two muscle groups that waste really, really quickly 
if you've got hip arthritis. And the reason they're waste is because you're just not using them. That hip doesn't move particularly well, which means that it won't, ter it won't move terribly well, which means those muscles don't get used and they kind of get wasted away, all right? So, hip replacement scar aside, you can't feel that, but then you can move on to feel. So, in other examinations, they talk about feeling the joint line. Now, the joint line in the hip is very hard to feel, You've muted. Can't hear you. you. You've muted yourself. Sorry, let me see. If I... <laughs> Can everybody hear me again? Yeah. Good. Sorry about that. Um, so let's, I'll take it from feel again, okay? So feeling in a lot of other exams, so for example, if you think about the knee exam, which we're gonna come on to soon, feeling also includes the um, joint line, but the joint line in the hip is deep. It's kind of about there. So between the pubic tubercle and the asis, it's halfway down, it's deep in here. It's a good few minutes with, uh, with dissection down that way. So you can't feel the joint line. So the only bit to feel on the hip examination is the great trochanter. So if I can swap you out for a second, please. So I'm going to borrow you for a second. Now, you can all try this yourself, okay? Your great trochanter is probably a little bit further around the back of your leg than you think. Why can't you say yeah. So this lump just here, if I grab my pen. <laughs> here's our great trochanter, and that's the line of the femur down there. Okay, so here's the great trochanter, and the way to feel it is if you stand up and you put your hand where your pocket is. So around about in your pocket, if you stand up and you put your hand in your pocket and you internally and externally rotate the leg, you'll feel the trochanter go past your finger. So in the hip examination, that's the only one that you can feel. That's our, that's our feel kind of over and done with, okay? So, that's our feel over and done with. The only other thing we're going to feel is temperature. <laughs> temperature is very hard to feel. Again, the hip joint, if you've got an effusion in there and there's a problem, the temperature is going to be hard to feel because it's a deep joint. Okay? So, then we're on to move. So, move is done on the bed. So, ask the patient to lie down. So, if I can drag my daughter into view. So, the only two movements we're going to do for hip examination are hip flexion. So, what I would suggest you do, if you hold, hold the ankle here and lift the knee to give them a helping hand and bring the knee, bring the hip up, you can see in a good normal hip, there should be about 130 degrees or so of flexion. Now, if you set the patient up and the patient sitting, this is what I'm saying. The trunk gets in the way, so you can't flex the hip. So the correct position is really important here. Otherwise, the answer you get is going to be wrong. And remember, of course, if you're going to do if you're going to do anything that hurts the patient, you need to be looking at the patient's face. And the other thing you need to do is ask the patient to move first. So what I would suggest you do is ask the patient, can you touch your heel on your bottom? They might not be as flexible as that in Sunderland or if they've got arthritis, but my daughter is quite flexible. So ask the patient to bit first. So I would say, look, can you bend your knee and touch your heel on your bottom and then hug your knee into your chest like that? And then you know how much the patient's hip can be expected to move and then you can look appropriately as you're doing it passively, okay? So active movement first, passive movement second. Excellent. So that's the hip flexion. The other one to do is, internal and external rotation. So the way I would do this is combine it with the flexion. So when I'm doing the passive flexion, I would flex the hip up as much as it can, so 130 degrees here, and then bring it back to 90 degrees. And then if you look from over the top of the hip, and you can use the tibia as a protractor. So internal rotation is with the foot pointing outwards, external rotation the other way. In hip arthritis, which is really common in an OSCE, 
rotational movement is one of the first things to go. So you might find the hip internal rotation is lost and the external rotation might be a little bit worse as well. Okay, so internal rotation goes first, then external rotation. Okay, so that's hip. That's hip movement. So the last thing to do are the special tests. Now, Dara, castanets. So the castanets are to warn you. It's incredibly easy to do the special test badly. And it's really, really easy to get them right. I would say that if you're doing a MSK examination, if you're doing an MSK examination, you should be really pleased because in the Mosler and the Oski situation, I think there are much harder things to get than MSK stations. So it makes no sense to get these wrong. We should be able to get all of these right, okay? So there are two tests to do. One is the Thomas test, and the other one is the Trendelenburg test. The Thomas test is gonna check for fixed flexion in the hip, and the Trendelenburg test is gonna check for abductor function, okay? Now, I'm gonna show you the Trendelenburg test first, and then the Thomas test, but actually, you could have done it the other way around because the patient was already on the bed and you could have done the Thomas test. The reason I'm showing you this way around is because the Trendelenburg test is, is universally very badly done. And I think it's probably the easy one of the two to get right. Okay, so, sorry, can I borrow your cursor? Right, so if we think about the Trendelenburg test, what we're gonna need to see are the ACEs. So here's an anterior superior iliac spine. And here's an anterior superior iliac spine. If you can see those in the sunlight, see the, the pink dots that I've drawn. Sorry, there's one and there's the other one. Thank you. So they're going to be our markers for what the pelvis is doing. Now, if you think of the, the abductors, there's one set here and one set here. And what they're doing is if you stand, stand on the yeah. oh, no, if, you, if you stand on one leg, what your abductors on this side, the side that Tara's standing on, is doing is holding onto the pelvis so that the patient's pelvis doesn't flop. So to, to test the patient's left abductors, the patient stands on the left leg. Thank you. So we have, we're testing the abductors that the patient is standing on, okay? So because Tara's standing on her left leg, I'm sorry, you can't really see very well here, but she's standing on her left leg, which means we're testing this set of abductors. Now, if you look at where her pelvis is, the pelvis, has gone up. Just relax here, stand on two legs. Do, go on. So if we get Neymar back again. So here are the ACEs here, and I've got them here. So if the abductors on this side are working, when Neymar stands on this leg, the pelvis should stay either level or go up on the other side, okay? So you can see this left-hand side is slightly higher than the right-hand side. Just relax again. And when she stands back on two legs again, they're level again. Stand on the other leg. And you can see again, see how my right thumb has gone up? Because when the abductors are working on the left side, the patient's pelvis on the right side goes up. Okay, good. So imagine if they weren't working. Can you stand on that side? What would happen if they weren't working was the pelvis wouldn't go up and actually it would go down. And that's what an abnormal Trendelenburg test looks like. Okay, so if these abductors, the abductors on the patient's left aren't working, the right side of the pelvis will dip down and will look like this. All right, now, if you think of who you're gonna do a Trendelenburg test on, patients aren't often as fit and well as my daughter here. They're often uh, getting on in age and they've got some arthritis and they probably haven't been asked to stand on one leg for about 30 years. So it's unfair to ask them just to stand on their legs like that. So here's my suggestion on how to do it. So if you position the patient in front of you, just like so, you can take your thumbs on the pelvis so you can show the examiner that you know exactly what you're looking for. And then if you take a brace position like this, I'll show you, hang on a second, so that you're nice and stable. And then you ask the patient to put their arms on your forearms. Hold on to my hand. So now when the patient stands on one leg, not only can you also be very clear and say, can you stand on this leg for me? The patient will get it right occasionally, like my daughter hasn't. However, you can be very, very clear about whether it's your left or the patient's left because you're giving them a very clear example. And also because they're holding on to you, they'll feel safe and they don't feel like they're gonna fall over. 
So I would say that's a nice, safe way to do a trend element test, okay? Are there any questions about that? I think you hopefully should be all unmuted. Are there any questions about the Trendelenburg test before I move on? Everybody happy? Crack it. All right. Let's get the bed back in again then. Okay, so the Thomas test. Thomas chest is going to check for a fixed flexion in the pelvis. So if you have really bad hip arthritis, your hip won't move the way it should move. And what you'll find is that it doesn't, it doesn't move independently of the other hip. So what we're going to try and do is use one hip to show the other hip not moving. Okay. Now imagine that Neymar hasn't got a hip replacement here. If we're trying to work out if the left hip has got a fixed flexion deformity, hip we're going to move is the right hip, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to stop the lumbar spine from uh, masking the deformity that she has, because if we don't do that, what will happen is we can move the leg anywhere we like, but because the pelvis and the lumbar spine are still flexible, they will flex and tilt and they will give the impression that the hip is not moving, okay? Now, so I'm really sorry, the contrast is quite bad there, but let's see if we can do this for you here. So, all right, if I come around the other side. Now, imagine there's a fixed flexion deformity in this left hip. If I put my hand under the lumbar spine and where it needs to go under the lumbar spine, just roll over on your side. Here. My hand needs to be here, absolutely in the midline, because what I'm trying to do is put my hand in here and block the lumbar spine from moving around to mask the movements of the pelvis. Okay, so roll back in. So one hand underneath the back. So get the patient flat on the bed. Okay, just relax. Hands under the back, and as a good guide, your hand needs to be completely under the patient. Name is obviously a bit smaller, but if you're an adult, if I can still see your palm, you probably haven't got your hand as far in as you need to be, okay? So the whole hand needs to be underneath the patient. If I can see your forearm, you're probably doing it well, all right? So the hand goes underneath, relax. And if I'm looking for a fixed flexion deformity on this left-hand side, I'm gonna ask the patient to move the right leg. So again, you can get the patient to help me, can you bend your knee up for me and then help them? Okay. And then can you take your knee and can you hug it into your chest? And what I would normally do, lay my hand, if I slip my hand underneath the knee on the side that we're testing, can you push your knee down onto the bed? Keep this leg nice and straight. There you go. So that's a really nice straight leg. Okay. Good. So come back out again. Now, imagine that we do have a fixed flexion deformity on this left hand side. If we do that again, bend your knee for me, please. And hold on to your knee, bring it into your hips, bring it into your chest as far as you can. That's what would happen. So this is showing a fixed flexion deformity on the left side. So by moving the right leg, we're testing the left hip, okay? And because the patient can't get the knee down on the bed, and at this point I would put my hand underneath and say, look, can you push my hand down onto the bed? And the patient can't. And that's a fixed flexion deformity, okay? Is everybody happy with that? There any questions just shout out all right good last one so jump up again, maybe. the last one is the gate so i would i would normally do the gate at the beginning because the normal patient would normally walk into the examination room so you could always watch them however if there's um uh, let me just admit some other guys um think about the gate so the one abnormality you're going to get, or the two abnormalities you're going to get in a hip patient or a knee patient, knee patient in particular, as well as a hip, is an antalgic gait, so is a limp. So you limp, spend less time on the leg that's got pain, so you have a very quick step on the side that's painful, and your normal step on the side that isn't painful. I'm, I'm sure I don't have to demonstrate a limp. I hope I don't have to demonstrate a limp. However, Trendelenburg gait is very interesting. So I can borrow our patient again. Now, Imagine you have a Trendelenburg test that's abnormal. So your abductors on this side are weak, okay? So I'm going to hold on to the weak abductors. So if you take a step with your bad leg, the abductors on the good side are working when the leg comes through, okay? So you're going to, you're going to test this side by standing on it. So remember, if you take a step with your bad leg and then take a step with your good leg, and when your good leg is off the ground, the only thing that's keeping your pelvis up 
The only thing that's keeping your pelvis up are the abductors on this side, which means the pelvis is going to drift. All right? So let's imagine Neymar has a trend elevator. So, so if I put my fingers on the pelvis here, on, when the good side is down and the other leg is swinging through, the pelvis is level. But when the good side swings through, the pelvis will dip. Okay? Be so because you're standing on the bad leg, the abductors on that side don't work, so the pelvis will dip down. Okay? So if I demonstrate it, if you imagine my left leg is weak, so my abductors here are weak, if I step through with my good leg, my pelvis is okay. But as soon as I put my bad leg down and then lift my good leg off the ground, my pelvis dips. Okay, so an, a trend elevator gait would be like that. Now, my daughters are laughing because I looked a bit sassy, but you can see the point. Okay, so when you stand on your bad leg, the test that you were doing statically becomes an active test, and that's what it is. All right? Good. Are there any questions about that? Just shout out if there are guys, okay? Because that's really the end of the hip examination. But for for uh, assessing a gait, is that the only, would you just get them to walk as they would normally or is there any yeah. particular? And so the other thing to remember is when you're looking, the look part also includes looking around the room. They might have a stick, they might have a Zimmer frame. So if they use the stick and the Zimmer frame to begin with, they would have to use one as well, wouldn't they? they, they you know, you wouldn't be able to magically walk without one just because you asked them. So have a look. So when they're walking, you can get them to use whatever frame sticks they used as well. Um, I just had one question about the um, Trendelenburg bit where you do where they're lying flat. Um, you know when you lift up like the right leg and then the left leg is flexed? Yeah. Would that be painful for them? So you would have done their passive movement first when you've done their movement in the movement part because it's look, feel, move, and then the special test. So you would know how much they could bend that hip up. Again, if they have a very stiff hip, you get them to move the hip as much as they can. If they can't get it up into their chest, then look, so be it, that's life, that's their hip. If they've got a hip replacement, you don't want them to hug that into the chest as well because it will dislocate, you're gonna over flex it. So you flex it to a safe point. And what I would normally tell you when, if we were in a room and we were doing this, if you see that scar for a hip replacement, for example, just kind of, you know, think it through, think through two steps. So what you're going to tell the examiner is, look, I think this lady's had a hip replacement. Do you really, you know, do you want me to do the Thomas test? They might say, look, that's fine. Don't worry about it. I'll do it on the other side. So, so just kind of think on your feet a little bit. I know it's difficult in the middle of, a, of an OSCE, but, but that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to teach. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Excellent. Now, the one thing I did miss uh, was leg lengths. I completely forgot. So in the feel part of the examination, leg lengths is what we need to do as well, okay? So if I can borrow Tara again. Bring the tape in your Come So if you think about where we've made our mark, so if you can see this ace is just here. I'm not sure which one shows it better on the camera. Maybe that one, because it's a bit darker. So there's the anterior superior iliac spine. And the way we're measuring it to is a medial malleolus. Yeah? Because that's a fixed bony landmark. So the way I would measure when you're doing the feel, so after you've felt the greatest recanter, if the tape goes on the asis, you can see that in a second. Tape goes on the asis there, can you see? And goes down to the medial malleolus and that's a true leg length. There's no real reason to do an apparent leg length. A true leg length is all you need. We don't really use an apparent leg length for this in the NOSCI. So a true leg length goes from the asis down to the medial malleolus, and you should do that on both sides, and they can be within a centimeter, a centimeter and a half of, other, of each other side. Okay? Splendid. So if there are no more questions, I'm gonna move on to the knee examination then. Everybody happy? Cracking. Easy, right? Easy peasy. Would you rather do that or do an ECG? I know what I'd rather do. All right. So, oh, yeah. Approach the room. 
So let's bring my uh, erstwhile eldest child and first heir off the bench to come in for a knee examination. So this is Amina. Amina is normally to be found looking at a telephone, but she's given up for five minutes so I can, we can have a look at her knees. So I'll put my uh, thing midget down. So now if you look at knees, look is very important to do standing as well as lying for knees because standing will bring out a varus or a valgus deformity. Is everybody clear about varus and valgus deformity? So varus, just put your legs together. So here's a normally aligned limb. Yeah, if I spin you around so slightly, here's a normally aligned limb. Normally, the femurs bow out slightly and the, the tibias bow in. So you've got a sort of diamond shape, but roughly the hips line up with the middle of the ankles. That's the, that's the axis of the human being. Some people have valgus knees, which is where from the, from the knees, the tibia deviates laterally. So that would be a valgus tibia. And the other way around, where from the knee, the tibia deviates medially, is a varus knee, okay? So Amina, you can see here, has nice neutral alignment of her lower limb. And when you stand, because it's often worse when you're weight bearing, that deformity becomes more obvious, okay? So again, the same thing, if you're looking, you wanna be looking for any loss of muscle. And again, if you've got knee arthritis, the, the tibial muscles don't really waste, but again, you'll get wasting of the quads and you'll get wasting of the hamstrings around the back. So it's particularly important to make sure that when you get the patient to stand up at the end to walk, you look from the back. Because the other thing you're gonna see is swelling in the popliteal fossa. So here are the popliteal fossas, and they're nice and empty. But you would see Baker cysts in there, you might see, if it's really big, a uh, popliteal aneurysm, but that's a pretty rare thing. And actually, it's easier in the feel because you're going to feel in the back of the knees as well. All right? Okay, so. Sarah, can I get in for a second? Yeah. Okay, so here are Tara's knees, okay? Particularly important when we're doing feel is to know what we're feeling and what we're looking at. Just take a step forward. So. You can get a bit of light on the matter. Here's what we're looking for, okay? So here's the patella, just around there. So if I draw around Tara's patella, there's Tara's patella. Can everybody see that? That's not particularly bright, I apologise. But there's Tara's patella. There it is. Good, thank you, Tara. The other bit that we need to feel is this lump down here. So just a little bit further down the tibia, is the tibial tuberosity. If I come out of the way, that might help matter slightly. A little bit further down the tibia is the tibial tuberosity. And it's this lump that you can see here. But there's the tibial tuberosity. And in between the two is the patella tendon, or the patella ligament more correctly, because it joins the patella to the bony lump of the tibial tuberosity. All right? So the other thing when we're looking we're looking at varus and valgus and we're looking for uh, any sinuses we're looking for any muscle wasting again we're looking for scars and in the knee the big scar is right here there's a knee replacement scar dirty great big line down the middle of the knee but more subtle can be small scars for knee keyhole surgery keyhole surgery scars are very small and they're on either side of the patella ligament. One there and one there. Okay, so they're the scars you might see around the knee. Can everybody see those? So you've got a big midline scar for a knee replacement and you've got these two small scars on either side of the ligament, which is where we put the camera and working instruments in. So there's the scars we're going to get around there. Okay? Can I borrow one of you again? I can keep using it. All right, so, so that's our look, okay? So we've got the patient standing, we've seen for varus valgus, we've been around the back of the patient, we've looked for those swellings in the popliteal fossa, we've looked for muscle wasting, we've looked for the scars around the front. So let's do a little bit of feel, okay? So what I would suggest is we get the patient on the bed. All right, so. Sorry, if I just drag the bed a little bit closer so you can see what we're doing. So, for feeling the knee, think about those bits that we've just marked, okay? 
So the one thing we're going to feel is around the patella. So I would start at the top of the patella, work all the way around on either side. And again, looking at the patient's face, if you do anything that causes pain or you think might cause pain, we're going to look at the patient's face while we're doing it. So there's around the patella. There's the inferior pole of the patella, down the ligament, tibial tuberosity. So no pain there. That's good. Now, the other thing that's important in the knee is the joint line. It's really important to feel the joint line properly. If you're going to feel the joint line, can you bend your knee for me? Bend it to 90 degrees because the joint line opens up. The knee locks shut like this, but when you flex it, rolls open like that. There's a roll open action to the knee and the joint line is to be found here, okay? So this knee is nice and slim. If it's not slim, the way to do it is to feel the tibia. There's the tibia, it's a subcutaneous bone. Run your fingers up the tibia until you feel a divot. And the divoty bit, there it is. That's the soft spot, that's the start of the joint line. And if you feel that, you'll feel a ridge between the two bones. Namer's ridge is just here, and that's my finger around the joint line. So that's the top of the tibia. And similarly, if I borrow the other knee, you can see that divot just there, and I can feel nicely around the joint line. Again, watch the patient while you're doing it. The joint line is particularly important to feel properly, not because it carries a lot of marks, which it does do in the exam, but it's also really important because we're gonna find a lot of pathology here. You might feel an osteophyte, you might feel there's pain there when you're feeling it around for the patient because that is where arthritis, particularly on the medial side, causes pain. Meniscal injuries often present with joint line pain as well. That's a really sensitive indicator. So it's really important to feel that joint line correctly. Okay, good. Any questions about the joint line? The maracas should have gone off. You wouldn't believe the fact that they've done off. Yusuf, yeah. um, sorry, I know you're in the middle of teaching, but will you just check as you're the host to this meeting, and I think there's some people still oh. been trying to join. Just double check for me. I got them. Thanks. Everybody in? Nobody. Just keep reminding me, Julie. Okay. Good. So now the other thing to feel is effusion. Two tests for effusion. One is a patella tap, and the other one is a patella sweep. Patella tap is for a large effusion in the knee. So I would expect to find a patella tap if you've got a huge effusion from arthritis or you've had a trauma and there's been bleeding in the knee and that type of thing, that would often give you a patella tap. So the tap is to bring all the fluid into the knee and use your thumb to press the patella down so it taps against the condyles of the femur, okay? And the way I would do that is I make a little U shape with the back of my hand and I bring it down keeping it in contact down to the top of the patella, and then with my other thumb, pressing down on the patella. But don't let go with your thumb. If you let go, you won't feel the tap, because the tap is transmitted through the patella and you're gonna feel it in this thumb, okay? So fluid down into the knee, thumb on, press. Sorry. So that's for a large effusion. Now, most people don't have a large effusion, and if I put my hand on my heart, I honestly I don't think I've ever, felt the patella tap properly. Uh, so the other test is, is a patella sweep. Sweep is a lot more sensitive. So even if you've got a small to moderate effusion, you should be able to find a patella sweep. So if you think of how we do a patella sweep, what we're trying to do is gather up all the fluid in the knee and take it to one place. So the way I would do it is I start on the medial side of the knee. So if you imagine I'm doing it on this left knee. So this is the medial side of the knee, the lateral side is around here, okay? I'm gonna use the pads of my fingers. So I'm not gonna use my fist to do it. I think that's quite a painful, sore way to do it. I'm not a very elegant way to do it, but the pads of your fingers, we're gonna put on, and I look at the patient's face when I start, and sweep my fingers up the medial side of the knee, keep the fingers in contact, and then bring them over the top of the patella and around to the lateral side. Now. You can see the dent here. We're gonna start off looking here, and then as the, the fluid comes, if you imagine it's a wave of fluid coming over around the top of the patella, as we've emptied this side, we're gonna keep looking here because as the, my hand gets onto the far side, if there's any fluid, it'll make a dent just there. And that's the patella sweep. Now I'll just shake your maracas again. So the maracas for that, because again, that's often done very badly. So remember, no fist, there's no place in orthopedics for a fist unless you have to register our job, maybe there's a place for it then. However, pads of the fingers, medial side of the knee, looking at the patient's face, 
empty out the medial side and then round the top of the patella and you're looking to see whether this part fills again. And you'll see a little bump here filled if the fluid is being transmitted. Okay? Is everybody happy with that? Any questions about those patella effusion tests? No questions here. Have you got any questions here? Good. Okay, so that's feel done. The only last part is you're going to feel in the back of the knee. And again, you're going to make sure you look at the patient's face while you're doing it. And you're looking for popliteal aneurysms. You're looking for a baker cyst swelling in the back of the knee. And then that's your feel done. Okay. Move is fairly straightforward again. So the knee is going to flex. So you're going to ask the patient to do it. So Tim, can you bend this knee for me and bring your hip into your bottom? So that's a nice full range of flexion in the knee, around about 120 degrees, 130 degrees or so and then back out straight again. And then when you do it passively, you're going to do the same thing again. So I would put my hand just underneath the patient's knee and then start lifting. Let your knee go lift it. And then with my hand on the patella to feel if there's any crepitus, flex the knee up. And again, watch the patient's face while you're doing it. There we go. And that's move. Move should be fairly straightforward in the knee. Okay, so the special tests in the knee, uh, anterior draw and posterior draw, and generally very well done. They should be fairly straightforward to do. So if you flex the knee up to 90 degrees, the first thing I would suggest is looking at the knee because posterior sag is one thing that we're looking for. Now, you can see the tibia here and the patella. If I put my hand on, there should be a nice straight line. But if you can imagine, if, if Neymar tore her PCL, what would happen is her tibia would sag backwards and you'd get a little chink of light here. So when I put my hand on, you'd see a little bit of light in front of it. And that's a posterior sag, okay? That, you get that with a PCL tear. So anterior draw and posterior draw, let me see if I can demonstrate this one for you. Now, you can't sit on the patient's foot. And the notion of fixing somebody's tibia with your forearms while you're trying to do this, I think is very, very hard. I don't, it's easy with Neymar because she's a child, so she's not got a particularly big, heavy leg. But if you have somebody who's big and heavy and adult, I think that's a very, very hard thing to do. So what I would suggest is put the patient's foot on your thigh. Make sure the knee's flexed to 90 degrees. So I know that Neymar's foot isn't going to go anywhere because it's bumping up against me. In which case, you can see very nicely, I hope I've got a nice lateral here from the camera. But if I put my thumbs on the tibial tuberosity and my hands around the back of the tibia, I should be able to draw the tibia towards me. And I don't know if you can see that. Hang on a second. If I come a bit closer. The ACL in the knee is going to stop anterior translation of the tibia and the PCL stops posterior translation. So if you look carefully, hopefully at Neymar's knee, Neymar has a nice, just relax. Neymar's got a nice springy ACL. So if I bring it forward, you should be able to see her tibia moving and you see these dents appear just here. And that's the vacuum being created in her knee because the ACL has got elastin and collagen in, so there should be a little bit of movement. So Neymar hasn't torn her ACL, she's not torn her PCL, but if I push and pull, you can see there's a kind of springy recoil and that's a nice normal ACL. If you've got an ACL tear, the tibia will come forward towards you by a centimetre or so, a centimetre and a half, and it won't have that control. It won't have a nice firm stop. So that, because it's springy, but I can't drag, look, I can lift Neymar's pelvis up off the couch. There's no, there's not that much give in that ACL. But if you've torn your ACL or your PCL, there will be a lot of give and it'll keep going. Okay? Everybody happy with ACL, PCL? Okay. Darren Maracas. So, the maracas are coming because, thank you, Tara. Thank you, Tara. Of all, thank you, Tara. Of all the tests that are done badly, this might be one of the worst ones. Collateral ligaments are really easy to do wrong. And part of the problem is that if you're trying to test the collateral ligament, so the lateral collaterals are just here, and the medial collaterals obviously on the other side just here. If you're trying to stress them, it's very easy to do this. So I see this in exams a lot, and this is not collaterals being stressed. This is hip rotation that we're doing. 
So that's not the correct way to do that test. So what you've got to try and do is keep the femur still and just the tibia has got to move, all right? And I would suggest there's a couple of ways of doing it. Now, I've got it easy today because Neymar's got nice small legs. So the way I would suggest you do it is this. You're gonna use two hands. If I'm gonna test this left leg, my right hand, I've made an L shape with it. See that? And this bit is gonna act as a kind of bar and it's sitting against the lateral side of Neymar's left knee. And my right hand is gonna do the work. And I'm gonna hold onto the ankle here. So the knee needs to be flexed at about 30 degrees. It needs to be nice and relaxed. And with my right hand is doing nothing apart from stopping the femur from moving. And my left hand is doing the work here. And I'm stressing these medial collateral ligaments. Now, my camera angle isn't great to show you, but there's about a millimeter or two of opening up here, okay? Now, it's impossible to do it the other way around, because if you can see, if I try and do that, the hip just rotates. So what I would suggest is, you put the leg down, swap your hands around. So this one is still gonna be the bar, but now it's on the inside of the leg, and this one is still gonna hold onto the ankle and still do the work. And that's the lateral, okay? If I show you the lateral on this side, my hands are the other way around, they're the lateral collaterals. Okay, so that's the way I would normally do it, but the human leg's quite big. You'd be surprised how big and heavy it is, and the only really way to tell is when you do an operation, unfortunately, where you take one off. It's, it's got a surprising heft to it. However, if, you, um, if you're struggling, so if the leg's really, really big, you can use a technique where you're gonna use your armpit and use your pelvis to stabilize the tibia, and use both of your hands to rock. So I'm gonna show you that one, okay? It might be a bit tricky because Neymar's legs are quite small, but if you, again, you've got to flex the, flex the, um, the knee, the tibia, hold on a second, if I can just assume that. Let's see if I can show you correctly. So on my, this is my iliac crest here. If I put Neymar's tibia on my iliac crest and I use my elbow to grip hold of it, I've got a bit of control of her leg now. So with both of my hands around the tibia and around the knee joint, if I move my body weight, I can keep the femur still and stress the collateral. So if I move away from Neymar, I'm stressing these medial collateral ligaments. And if I move towards Neymar, I'm stressing the lateral collateral ligaments. Okay? It's a bit easy to demonstrate when somebody's a little bit bigger, but hopefully that's <laughs> idea of it. Any questions on that one? Why don't you have the leg straight, uh, Mr. Mishler? So if you have the leg straight, the knee has a, an odd mechanism. If I just, uh, hang on a second, let me just tuck that up a little bit. Ooh, there we go. So the knee has an odd mechanism. It's got a screw home mechanism. So it's rather like the bottle, uh, like a lid of a bottle. So if you can remember from the dim and distant past, there's a muscle called the popliteus. And popliteus's job is to unlock the knee when it's screwed shut. And it's screwed shut when it's in extension. So if your knee's in extension, your tibia and your fibula are locked together. So even if your collateral ligaments aren't working, that strain will still be normal. So in this position where the knee is straight, like that, this is not the collateral ligaments that you're testing. You're testing the articulation between the knee, the proximal tibia and the distal femur. Okay. A good question though, Angus, thank you. Any other questions? because the last thing, the only thing we've got left to do is walking. And the only thing you will see actually, so you won't see a Trendelenburg test, you might do coincidentally, because just because they've got, because you're seeing them for a knee, doesn't mean to say that their hip is gonna be normal, but you might see a Trendelenburg that's abnormal, but you're looking for something like an antalgic gait. And like I say, when the patient is standing, really what you're looking for is their varus and valgus, because it's a weight bearing deformity, so it's gonna get worse. It gets worse when the patient's standing. So would you assess the um, varus and valgus deformity at the beginning with look or at the end when you're assessing their gait? I would probably do it in both. So if you're, if you're looking, you're going to repeat the look. Funnily enough, you're going to repeat the look when the patient's standing because not only is, a, is the varus valgus going to be worse, but also if you've got a swelling in the back of the knee, that can sometimes get worse as well. And it becomes more obvious to see the swellings at the back of the knee when the patient's standing. But you're going to look on the bed. Some patients have a very obvious varus and valgus malalignment. And you can see it when they're standing and when they're lying down. 
but I would do both is the answer. Are there any other questions? The question of my wife who's over on the sofa over there. Yes, dear. So my wife is asking whether I don't check the menisci. The answer is if I was seeing a patient in clinical practice, yes, I would check the menisci. But if you want to be very, very uh, Machiavellian about it, if you're sitting an OSCE or a Mosla, you don't need to check the menisci. But again, remember, if you've got a, a knee that's flexed at 90 degrees to feel the joint line, if they have pain on the joint line, one of your differential diagnoses, particularly in a Mosler, if you're going to talk about it, one of your differential diagnoses is going to be a meniscal injury. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Doctor. Do you Any need to questions? change, sorry, do you need to change movements if they've had a knee replacement, like you're doing a hip replacement? Sorry, just give me two seconds. Yes, you can. Thank you. Oh, right, sorry. I just uh, dismissed my uh, my students ish for the day. So sorry, what was that question again? Do you need to change some movements of the knee like you would in a hip if there's been a knee replacement? So a knee replacement is inherently a very, very stable joint. And actually, you can't dislocate it. If you in a hip replacement, if you flex the hip too much and particularly in rotation as a, or as a combination flexion rotation, there's a chance you might dislocate it. So you need to be very careful. But with a knee replacement, what you'll probably find is they should straighten it like you would do normally, but their flexion normally would be slightly less. So you, you wouldn't normally get the high degrees of flexion. You might do, it's not impossible, but I, I don't think I would change anything for a knee replacement. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? You said, uh, Mr. Mishler, with a posterior tag, you get, um, you get with a PCL tag, you get a posterior sag. Do you get yeah. any signs with PCL tear? at all. Any, I didn't catch that last bit, Angus. What was that, sorry? Do you get any signs with an ACL tear, like you get a posterior sag with a PCL tear? No. So if no. you've got a PCL, think of your knee like that. Your ACL stops this, and your PCL stops that. So if that's your tibia, that's your femur. Your ACL is going to stop this, and your PCL will stop that. So if you've got no PCL, you can see that that would happen. But if you've got no ACL, because gravity is doing a PCL, it won't do this. So there are some very, very subtle signs, but when you look at the knee that's ACL deficient, often you don't see anything. Often when you look at a PCL deficient knee, you don't see anything, but with the knee flexed at 90 degrees, because gravity is acting on, acting on the tibia, the PCL's job is not done. So you'll get this post okay. okay, so just anterior draw then, but, but pick it up, right. So remember that anterior draw, when, when I used to be taught, when I was a medical student, we used to sit on the patient's foot and we used to pull the tibia towards us. Two things I'd say about it. Number one, don't sit on the patient's foot. That's not allowed anymore. But you sit down on the, on the bed and you put the patient's leg up against your thigh. And the second thing is, I did hear, um, I'm not sure if it was a rumor or whether it's true, but somebody was teaching medical students that you had to pull the patient so hard that they came down off the bed. Now, that's just plain wrong. You don't have to pull the patient that hard because, again, just like this game hip, if you pull a patient off the bed in the middle of a mosla, that's going to be a very hard day for you. So I would suggest you pull it with a control force, like you saw me doing with Neymar's knee there. You don't have to put a huge amount of force into it. Orthopedics isn't always about force. It's also about the subtlety, because actually what you're trying to see is how far that tibia moves anteriorly compared to the normal side. The other thing I would say, just while everybody's um, quiet, is um, if you're examining both limbs, there is no reason not to be on the side that you're examining. The old convention of examining the, from one side of the bed is wrong for a lower limb, in my opinion, because you'll hurt yourself. A lower limb is really heavy. And if you're trying to do hip flexion and rotation on the other side from the wrong side of the bed, you will hurt yourself. So if, you're, if you've got to examine both limbs, swap bed sides. Be on the side that you're examining. And if there's a problem, just explain that's what orthopedics told you to do. Okay? Any other questions? Every stunt. Good. It's very easy. I promise you. It's really, really straightforward. And I think you should be able to do that relatively well and get most, if not all, the marks on a, an orthopedic MSK, OSCE, or a Mosler. Okay. So uh, I hope that was worthwhile. I hope you didn't see too much, too many views of my bottom. And I hope the lighting was okay so that everybody could see. Are there any last questions before I close the meeting? Okay. 
Well, if that's the case, thank you very much for joining me and putting up with my uh, my children and my name babble again. Um, and we'll send out some more uh, details for next week. Mr. Purushottam is going to do next week's teaching. Um, he's on call this week, which is why, unfortunately, he's not got much time free to do any teaching. And I'm on call next week, but he's not. So he's going to do the teaching next week. Um, and, and hopefully everybody got something worthwhile out of it. OK, any last questions or I'll, uh, I'll end the meeting there in that case. Thank you very much, Mr. Mishra. You're welcome, guys. OK, <laughs> see you later. Have a good weekend in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you.